Um, as you know, the question is not uh, whether we will have another pandemic in the future, but when. And one of the uh, factors that we may well push us towards an imminent new um, pandemic are actually is the impact on, of climate and health. So I'm really uh, grateful to Honorable Minister uh, Barakat to be with us today and talk us, to us about climate and health, and of course, ahead of the COP28 that will be held here in the UAE. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, one of our uh, senior colleagues in the global health world, uh, Peter Piot, was the first, one of the first to say, you cannot consider pandemic preparedness without taking into consideration climate um, and, and how true that is. And if you allow me, I'll just show, share with you some slides to highlight the connection between climate and health. The WHO has stated that climate is the biggest challenge to health of the 21st century. And if you look at a recent report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they say that under a high emission scenario, uh, we're expecting 9 million deaths every year by the end of the century, just on climate reasons alone. Um, if, if countries implement the Paris Agreement by the year 2050, we could be saving one million lives every year just from pollution alone. And of course, there's a financial toll in that, you know, by the end of this decade, by the year 2030, we're looking at uh, a cost of climate impact on health of between two, two to four billion dollars every year. So climate does a lot of things that impact human health. And uh, you, you will have seen tragic uh, news of flooding, heat waves. Um, of course, zoonoses, which means the jump of an, an infection, a disease from an animal to humans. And that's, that's what triggered the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Vector-borne diseases. Um, vectors are... Uh, essentially uh, organisms that, cover, that, that carry other uh, organisms that cause disease in humans, for instance, mosquitoes. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more on, on mosquitoes in a minute. And other things that affect what we call non-communicable disease like mental, mental health. So climate change has a real impact uh, on human health and we need to take this very seriously. Um, I'm just going to talk a little on mosquitoes, and forgive me, this is not a nice topic, but just to tell you there are many mosquitoes uh, in the world, and, but these are three of the nastiest on the screen. The one uh, on, your, on the left, Anopheles, carries malaria. The one in the middle, Ides, carries dengue. And the one on the right, uh, Culex, carries West Nile fever. These are all... Uh, nasty diseases, many of, uh, and, and in many scenarios, especially with children, will cause death. The WHO has stated that climate change is causing a surge in mosquito-related illnesses, particularly malaria and dengue. And we believe it's related to warmer temperatures, uh, redistribution of, of water, human activity. So many things uh, are... Uh, related to climate are, are causing a, a surge on these illnesses. And this is the burden of malaria. Uh, we're talking about children under the age of five dying from cerebral malaria, uh, entirely preventable. And, and this tragic scenario happens over and over again. We're talking about, you know, of the 619,000 deaths from malaria in the year 2021, about 80% were for children under the age of five. That's half a million children. So half a million children every year, and that's, going to, that's expected to rise. These children are dying from an entirely preventable disease. 
To add to this, another of the mosquitoes that's called Stephensi, Anopheles stephensi, having been largely confined to South Asia, is now entering Africa because of warmer temperatures and other things. And the problem with this particular mosquito vector, so this Stephensi carries, carries malaria, the problem with this one is it actually likes to bite during the daytime. So a big mainstay of managing malaria in, in the sub-Saharan region has been giving children uh, bed nets that are covered in insecticides. The problem with this mosquito is that it bites during the day. And if it bites during the daytime, the bed nets are mostly ineffective. You know, you're not, you don't even, it's no point protecting them at night when the biting is also happening in the daytime. Um, and the other worrying thing about this mosquito is that it seems to be resistant to most of the insecticides, particularly the ones used in indoor room spraying. So this is of a concern. Anopheles has a cousin, it's called Ides, we saw it in, in the slide of the mosquitoes. This mosquito carries dengue and climate change has accelerated the invasion of this mosquito into warmer, uh, into, into other, other climates that are not prepared for it. Um, it carries dengue and dengue is now uh, spread in many, many uh, countries. And the WHO has said that it's actually present in almost every, in, in every WHO region. It will soon be endemic in the United States and many countries in Europe. And um, the, the number of people that are predisposed to it um, are almost half the numbers of people in the world. The numbers of people who, who have uh, been modeled to have caught it last year were 390 million. Uh, of whom just under 100 million were symptomatic, and, and the number of deaths are in the thousands. So this is what we're talking about when, when we are worried about climate change. Moving on to other non-vector issues like air pollution, we know that over 90% of people breathe unhealthy levels of, of air. Uh, a senior surgeon in, uh, uh, in North India, in New Delhi, um, is well known to speak about these topics. And he said that whereas in the 80s, 90% of his patients with, with lung cancer were, were smokers, he's saying that now uh, half of them are non-smokers. And of those, um, uh, a fifth uh, are actually between the ages, are under the age of 50. So we, we, we really need to take stock of this and start acting. And this is where COP28 comes in. For the first time, a COP is hosting a dedicated day for, clim for, for health issues uh, brought on by climate change. And that day will be on the 3rd of December while COP is being hosted here in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai. Um, and and what COP20, on, on that day, what we hope will happen is that it will be a watershed moment for climate and health where we will uh, raise the issues of, of the seriousness of climate and health issues, lobby support, and hopefully raise the issue of health on the political agenda. There will be the first ever ministerial on climate and health. Um, we will be discussing public health issues, uh, how to build um, systems, health systems that are strong enough to, to deal with the climate changes. Um, and, and also we'll address how to do this in a low carbon uh, way. So there's no point building hospitals that will generate more carbon. Um, we're talking about looking at ways of doing it in a low carbon method. Um, of course, climate change disproportionately affects uh, the most vulnerable uh, in the world, uh, women, children, ethnic minorities, poor communities, migrants or displaced people, other populations, um, and those with underlying health conditions. And we, we have to address how to help developing countries deal, deal with this problem. This is what health system strengthening look li looks like. We won't go through all, all the topics, but it's a, 
it's a, it's a holistic approach. You can't just take one element and say, this is what a strong health system will look like. You need all the elements. And I will always emphasize leadership and governance. So number one is a very important component of a country's response to threats. And of course, the last one is financing. You can't do any of this without dedicated financing for, for, for dealing with, these, uh, with the adaptation. Um, on the Health Day in COP28, uh, we are hope, hoping to uh, proceed with um, endorsement for a, a declaration on climate and health. This declaration was announced uh, during the World Health Summit in Berlin on the 17th of October this year. And we're hoping that before the start of COP, we would have had uh, many countries endorse it. And the declaration essentially is split into three parts. It talks about adaptation, the importance of adaptation to deal with climate health issues. It talks about increasing financing because, you know, we, we cannot... Uh, it isn't a matter of taking more money from the climate budget. This needs to find its own source of funding. And then it also talks about the importance of mainstreaming health in all the, all the climate uh, agendas. And, and on my last note, what is the legacy of COP28 when it comes to health? At the end of the day, it's trying to save as many lives as we can by urgent catalytic action. Um, and including novel <coughs> mechanisms for, for looking at, uh, uh, at response. Um, so in, in summary, COP28 will be a call for action for the first time for climate and health issues. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, and congratulations to the, uh, for this initiative on bringing health into the COP28, uh, a major challenge for, for the future and pandemic preparedness.